the special grand jury order can only be used and convened if there is a matter that cannot be handled by the regular grand jury. And also, as a circuit chief circuit judge, you must make it specific as to what they are doing. If I simply say a special grand jury is convened to investigate the judge executive's office, well, that opens Pandora's box. And that's not what this special grand jury was about. It was about the specific allegation that he was trafficking in drugs based upon the sheriff's lengthy investigation. This was a limiting order. This was not a broad order. It was limiting the special grand jury to what they could do and look into. That was the purpose of specifically stating what it was about. So Are you familiar, Judge, with yes. Harris 29A220 and 29A060? I reviewed them before I did this, yes. And are you familiar with any language within those particular statutes that require you, that mandate that you disclose the subject of the grand jury investigation and the target of the grand jury investigation when you issue a special grand jury order? They do not mandate you, but as a practical pur purpose for my discussions with other judges, you limit what the special grand jury is going to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, then on April 23rd, the following day, mm -hmm. April 22nd, I understand, was a Thursday. Yes. All right. Civil uh, motion hour for me when I, do, when I do most of my paperwork, yes. If you'll note on that film, uh, I only have one clerk, so I get to get up and pull my files and go through my files and set back down and put my files back up. That's civil motion hour, yes. Mm -hmm. So grand jury um, is going to do. Then today. on April 23rd, mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> Yes, sir. This is an order entered in the um, Potter v. Howard case. Then called out order. That is my order of recusal, yes. Day. You decided on the 2nd, I understand, it was April 23rd to recuse yes. in the Potter v. Howard case, correct? I did. All right. And then that was filed in the clerk's office um, on April 26th, I think, correct? Yes, I would assume that's Monday morning. All right. Um, and what was it that, if you were going to conduct a hearing involving Judge Grisham and summon him to a hearing, what made you decide to enter that order the next day? The reason that I was conducting the evidentiary hearing is because I knew the affidavit was false. I did not believe that Joe Grisham had signed that affidavit, or if he did sign the affidavit, he didn't know what he was signing. And as turned out later, Mr. Joe Grisham signed a statement for me saying he did not read the affidavit, that he was not sworn to the affidavit, and that the affidavit should not be relied upon. Quite frankly, this case, Potter versus Howard, went on for about three years. And one of the things you need to understand, Mr. Mando, why I was a little bit agitated in this case was that initially Mr. Howard had two attorneys, Rodney Buttermore, the one standing there with him, and a fellow named Otis Doan. Now, Otis Doan was with Mr. Howard. He had filed an answer on behalf of Mr. James F. Howard to Nellie Lawana Potter's lawsuit. Simultaneously, however, in the Harlan Circuit Court, Otis Doan was defending Nellie Lawana Potter in two other civil actions. And this case moved right along smoothly until it became aware that the court became aware that Miss Potter's attorney defending her in two other simultaneous circuit court actions filed in 2007 and 2006 was now defending James Frank Howard against Mr. Nellie Lawana Potter. Mr. Doan uh, got out of the case. He, he was he was out of the case because of that obvious conflict, which has a special rule for attorneys on that. You cannot simultaneously represent people with adverse interests in, in a situation like this. I couldn't believe that had happened. There was no motions to recuse. There were no problems in this case until Mr. Doan had to get out, until Mr. Howard lost the advantage of having an attorney who was representing Ms. Howard and him simultaneously in actions. When he had to get out, that's when all this stuff started popping up. And my, so, question, my question, Judge, yes, was, sir. And is on April 22nd, yes. when we had this hearing in Potter versus Howard, and we played the DVD, by the way, which we've marked as Exhibit Number 10 yes. for the record, um, you indicated that you were initially you were going to deny the motion on the ground cited in the written motion, and then you indicated you were going to schedule a hearing to have Joe Grishop come in in order to decide what to do, correct? You were going to hear testimony from, Mr. from Judge I, Grisham. I was going to have Mr. Grisham come in because I believe with all my heart, and I still believe with all my heart, as proved true later on, that this document entitled Affidavit was not true. 
and Mr. Grisham admitted that later on and signed a document that I submitted to the Commission in, in the preliminary I, phase I, of this matter. I understand that. Yes. What I want to understand, and I'm yes. sorry if my question is poorly worded, yes. is that on April 22nd, the morning of April 22nd, you had denied the motion and you had set a hearing for Judge Grisham to come in to testify. I denied two parts of the motion that were clearly ones that I felt I didn't have to recuse in. I mean, against an election and, and representing someone in a case in 2004 or 2000, no, 2002, I think, uh, in regard to the matter. Particularly after the case, Mr. Mando had been going for two and a half years. I understand that, Judge. And yes. And all I'm saying is you, you denied it based on those two grounds, as indicated on the hearing. Yes. Then you received the Grisham affidavit. Based upon your review of the Grisham affidavit, you, you didn't think it was true, correct? That was your initial thought in your head when you read Me it. I immediately knew it wasn't true. And so you decided you were going to call Judge Grisham in to have a hearing on what, uh, to hear testimony from him on that, correct? That's what you just that's yes. what you did. Yes. Then, because I didn't believe he. Had then you been issue. Signed. Then you issue the special grand jury order for Judge Grisham later that day. Yes. Then what causes you to enter the order? What happens? What occurs that causes you to enter that order that you signed on April twenty third, recusing from the Potter v. Howard case? Well, in the order I put, this matter having come. This is Exhibit twelve. This matter having come before the court and defend this motion for, for presiding circuit judge to recuse, and the court having previously overruled the motion on two unrelated grounds and the motion to recuse, and the third ground being explored in open court and appearing to the presiding judge that the chairman of the IDA board in Harlan County, James F. Howard, had in fact made a lease purchase agreement to a company owned solely by him. Said lease purchase agreement for certain real property owned by the IDA board. The court finds that he may be a material witness in any further investigation and therefore recuses for that sole purpose and sole purpose only. But you had not yet had the hearing with Judge Grisham test, uh, where you were going to hear testimony about whether what he was saying in the affidavit was correct or incorrect. Right? I don't understand your question, sir. When you left the hearing on April 22nd, you wanted Judge Grisham to come in to give testimony about the content of this affidavit, which you thought was false. Correct? Yes. And if that was false then there wouldn't be grounds for you to recuse because you'd already rejected two other grounds out of hand. Correct? Correct. But within 24 hours, you enter an order recusing in Potter versus Howard. Yes, on a different ground. It was my belief, and as it turned out later, it was my belief that I would be a material witness into an investigation of Mr. Howard's, uh, what I believe to be illegal activities of uh, and basically deeding himself a piece of public property for free and collecting money off of it for years. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, I was interviewed by the investigators in regard to Mr. Howard's activities, and Mr. Howard was subsequently charged with an ethics violation and referred to the Commonwealth Attorney by Crit Llewellyn's office for a criminal investigation that Mr. Henry Johnson refuses to look into. So I believed I would be a material witness, yes, and I got out of the case. As soon as it dawned on me this was going to happen. And without the hearing where you were going to hear testimony from Judge Cush? It became a moot point when I recused on another issue that was the reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't see the sense in staying in it when I knew I had to get out of it. Let me show you, which, I know this is an exchange in discovery. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure you can authenticate or not for identification purposes only. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you what I've marked as Exhibit 13. It's an email, strand, I think it's dated April 20, looks like, at the bot started on April 25th at about 9.29 p.m. from yes. David Smith to a number of folks who I understand to be reporters or media people. Yes. All right. Uh, have you I've seen, seen this through discovery. I saw it in one of our informal conferences when I was given by, given to me by Mr. Jim Lawson, former executive secretary. All right. And do you know uh, 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 the source of this particular document, in other words, who uh, tipped off David Smith that uh, this special grand jury order had been entered on Thursday, April 22nd? I have no idea. I have no idea who David Smith is. Right. Did, you, um, did you think that by entry of the special grand jury order on April 22nd and the fact that that was filed in the circuit clerk's office, that that type of order would have an impact on the primary uh, a couple weeks forward? Did that thought enter your head? No, did not. It was, uh, to me, I was doing my job, what I was requested to do by the Commonwealth Attorney. Then, 
On May 3rd of 2010, that was a Monday, as I understand it. You recall yes. that day? Yes. Um, I recall May 3rd was a Monday, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you receive an email from, from Commonwealth Attorney uh, Johnson on May 2nd uh, advising you that he was going to present the Grisha matter to the regular grand jury on Monday morning, May 3rd? I think there was an email sent Sunday afternoon to my business email address saying that he was going to present something to the grand jury. Uh, I'm never in my office on Sundays. Uh, I observe that day for the Lord and my family. And Mr. Johnson has never sent me an email the entire time that I've known Mr. Johnson that I'm aware of. And that was sent to my business address, and he put in the email that I discovered later, after this was all over, that he had forgotten my home number, and he didn't know how to get a hold of me on a Sunday afternoon. Keep in mind, Mr. Mando, that I used to serve on the deacon board with Mr. Henry S. Johnson, and all my numbers were in the book that he as a deacon at the Harlem Baptist Church at that time had. It was obvious to me what that email was about. So, yes, there was an email sent on Sunday afternoon that I didn't see for some time after the grand jury, he presented it to the regular grand jury. And during the, week, during the week between April 27th and May the 3rd, between Monday, April 27th and Monday, May the 3rd, there were media reports about the special grand jury order and the fact that Judge Grishop was the subject of this investigation of selling drugs out of his office, correct? Let me get clear on the time frame you're saying, okay? Media, April 27th was a Monday. April 27th was a Monday. After the, special, after the special grand jury order was entered on the 22nd of April, correct? Correct. Right. The following Monday is what you're discussing. Yes. Okay, now you say there were media reports on that Monday. I'm saying there were media reports the week. You're, let's back it up and get the sequence down. We know that April 22nd was a Thursday. Yes, sir. So, right. motion sir. so um, I guess it would have been Monday, April 26th. My apologies. During that week, the week of April 26th, there were media reports about the special grand jury order and the fact that Judge Grishop was the subject of a criminal investigation for selling drugs out of his office. My recollection of it, Mr. Mando, was that on Monday, I don't think there was any media reports happened on Monday. I think the story broke the way I understand it, the way I recall it, when Nola Sizemore, the Harlan David Enterprise, printed his story and let other media outlets uh, know about the special grand jury order that she had been given by Henry S. Johnson. That's the way I understand how it became a media event. And all I'm, a I'm asking how. I'm just okay. asking you, Judge, are you aware of the fact that there were media reports of this order and stories about this order that came out during the that week of April 26th? It came out on Tuesday was the first first news media report that I was aware of, yes. And did, were there more media Tuesday reports? Tuesday the 28th of April, I believe. Yes. Were there more media reports during the course of the week? There were numerous media reports during the course of the week. All right. And then in the next two weeks, and then after the special grand jury. And then on May the 3rd, the Commonwealth Attorney decided to present this matter to the, grand, to the regular grand jury involving Judge Grishop and the allegations of selling drugs out of his office, correct? I don't know when he decided to do it because he never told me. When he decided to do it, he simply he presented did it. it. You're aware of the fact that he presented it to the regular grand jury on Monday, May the third. I became aware of the fact that he was going to present the case to the regular grand jury as I came into my office that morning. I was totally unaware that that was going to happen. And when you found out that Commonwealth Attorney Henry Johnson was presenting this matter to the regular grand jury in Harlan County, did you become upset? Absolutely, I became upset. Did you become angry? You know. I'll say this to you. I don't think I was fighting mad, but let me say this to you. I was upset, and I was not happy that I had been lied to. You can take that to the bank. Mm -hmm. And then did you summon Mr. Johnson to your office on May the 3rd? I summoned one of the bailiffs to get Mr. Johnson so I could find out what was going on. Yes, sir. And did you then? Confirm what I had already suspected. And. Did you have a discussion with him then at that point in the hallway? I had a discussion with Mr. Johnson 28 feet from me. And yes. were you yelling at him? I was not yelling at Mr. Johnson, no, sir. Um, I was speaking in a, in a tone, absolutely, but I was not yelling. 
And you were upset? You ask my kids what it sounds like when I have to yell, and I was not yelling. And you were upset about the fact that he had presented this matter to the regular grand jury, and you were upset about the fact that he had not told you about it in advance? I was upset because Mr. Johnson had requested a special grand jury. Mr. Johnson had released a copy of the special grand jury order to the media. Mr. Johnson had lied to me. If he didn't want a special grand jury, all he had to say is, I don't want a special grand jury. What I knew was going on at that point was is that he and Marvin Lidford of the Sheriff's Office were getting rid of a bad egg that they were trying to hatch and dumped it in my lap right in the middle of an election year to help Marvin Lidford and to destroy me for the Commonwealth Attorney. It was as plain as the nose on my face when I saw that happen. And you're aware of the fact, of course, that Mr. Johnson maintains that you leaked the issuance of the grand jury order to the media. I have never heard Mr. Johnson say that I leaked it. He's always implied it to everyone out all right, there. Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. It, it, all right. um, you, never get, you never get Mr. Johnson to really admit a whole lot other than what he does behind closed doors, in my opinion. And am I correct that uh, when you found out about this regular grand jury hearing the testimony, did you understand that from talking with Commonwealth Attorney Johnson that he felt that it was important for the regular grand jury to hear this evidence and report on May the 3rd before the primary election so that Judge Grishop would get a clean shake if they returned a no true bill? Did he, ever, did he ever communicate that to no, you? No, sir. He did not. And uh, then after you had this uh, conversation where you were upset with, Doc, with uh, Henry Johnson, uh, on the morning of May the 3rd, did you also say anything to the detectives who were waiting to testify before the grand jury? I did walk down there to, look, to talk to Mr. Johnson again to find out, to let him kind of explain to me after the initial shock of what he did wore off. And I walked in there to look for Mr. Johnson. I looked in the side room. I never went in the grand jury room at any time. And anyone that says that is a bald-faced liar. And the simple fact of the matter is I asked the detectives, where Mr. Johnson was, they said they don't know. I told them they better tell the truth in this matter, and I was referring to the setup dumping it in my lap. They better tell the truth in this matter because it would be looked into. And the simple fact of the matter is I left it to that. I didn't cuss anybody. I didn't scream at anybody. I simply said that. And I went back to my office, and I prepared for the political and character assassination that inevitably came like a hurricane. Did you tell those detectives to make sure not to perjure themselves? I said, do not. I said, you better tell the truth. This will be looked at. That's what I said. And Let me show you a certified copy of the new true bill marked as exhibit number 14. Yes, sir. The regular grand jury returned a no true bill after hearing testimony and considering the evidence that was presented by the Commonwealth Attorney on May the 3rd, correct? Yes. Right. And that no true bill was presented to you as the Circuit Court Judge? No, sir, it was not. <clears throat> Who was it presented to? Presented to the Circuit Clerk. Pursuant to the rule, no true bills just returned to the Circuit Clerk, not to the Circuit Judge. Okay, I stand. If, Thank if you, it's Judge. a true bill, the Circuit Judge signs it and usually sets a bond or issues a warrant. If it's a no true bill, it simply is filed a report in the Clerk's office. Okay. And, the way I understand the rule. And when did you become aware that that no true bill had been entered? When I went home and was having a sandwich, talking to my kids, and turned on the news, and Henry Johnson was giving a press conference. Mm -hmm. um, did Henry Johnson at any point in time tell you that based upon – oh, let, let me rephrase that. Before I turned on the news, Nola Sizemore had called and asked me if I wanted to make a comment on it. She was doing the story on it. And I said I could make no comments. And before – you heard that before you got the call from Nola Seisman. Yeah. Had Henry Johnson, during any of these uh, this discussion you had with him uh, when you had the bail come get him, did he tell you that there was going to be a no true bill because Ms. Hensley was a drug addict who was not credible, because Judge Grisham had passed a polygraph, because the Attorney General had found no evidence to support these allegations against Judge Grisham? Did he mention those facts to you that day? I don't recall him mentioning those facts to me, no. Did you know those facts at any point before that day? That Melissa Hensley was a drug addict? Yes. Right. So did the detectives, Marvin Lipford and Henry S. Johnson. Now, 
like probably 99.9% .9 of every person that has a criminal charge or record in Arlen County, they are usually have a drug problem. Yes, sir. Now, on May the 3rd, after you, you were upset about what had happened, the fact that this was presented to the regular grand jury, did you... I want to clarify that. That's not my answer. My answer is I was upset that I had been lied to, that I had, been, had a request for a special grand jury and been told that it couldn't be presented to the regular grand jury. And then the Commonwealth Attorney and the Sheriff, for their own political motives, in my opinion, presented it to the very same grand jury they told me it could not hear this case. My apologies. My apologies, Your Honor. I, did not I, mean, I just want to be clear about I that. I understand that I'm not, it's not my intent to mischaracterize and I, and I know that. And I appreciate I apologize. That. I just want to be clear because the record will be looked at someday, I'm what sure. What I'm saying is, though, is that you were upset. And that same day that you had this meeting with Henry Johnson in which you had had the bail summoned into your office, you revoked. He never made it to my office. All right. In the hallway then. Wherever the discussion took place, okay, in the I'm sorry. County Courthouse, you revoked his electronic secure access to secure parts of the courthouse, correct? Absolutely. And you revoked the electronic secure access that the sheriff had to the Harlan County Courthouse, correct? Absolutely. <clears throat> because they had all access cards, access to let them come into my hallway whenever they wanted to. Mm -hmm. And according to the AOC, who I consulted with, they advised me it was totally in the discretion of the circuit judge who had cards and who didn't, particularly as those employees were not employees of the Kentucky Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. And I didn't particularly want people that would lie and set you up milling around in my hallway, to be quite frank with you. And that, by, by revocation, uh, revocation of their secure access, that made uh, their performing their jobs a little more difficult in terms of getting access no, to the courthouse, bringing files in and out of the courthouse. Uh, no, sir, it did not. The Commonwealth see. Attorney's Office still maintained a card that, that his assistant, Mr. Johnson, has two assistants. Jason Jackson is a full-time assistant for the Commonwealth Attorney's Office. Another fellow by the name of J.D. Smith had an access card that he uses regularly that was never erased. The Commonwealth Attorney's Office still had one card and could have used that to pull in the back like Mr. Smith does and bring their files in uh, any time they desired that. And the Sheriff's Office, any time the Sheriff needs access to the building, the entire security staff is employed by the Harlan County Sheriff's Department. So he could have access to anywhere he wanted to go as long as he had a security officer with him or used one of their cards. Then why revoke his personal access? Because I did not want them to have access to my hallway. Okay, there's a door. That's what you need to understand when I was trying to explain to you when he was summoned. Long before this happened, there was a standing problem in the Harlan Circuit Court of lawyers and whoever else bebopping coming to the judge's office. That was the way it was before I was elected to circuit judge. You come up the back elevator, or go through the door, walk into the previous circuit judge's office, and just start talking. It was my desire from day one to alleviate that. And what I did was, is I had another door installed that the only card that could be used on that was an all-access card. Now, the sheriff was given an all-access card, and the Commonwealth attorney had an all-access card, as was the custom that the previous judge had before. As a courtesy, and wanting to get along with other elected officials, I allowed that to continue. However, when this came up, when this was a situation where it was obvious to me that these two gentlemen would lie, set a man up, and drop it in his lap like he did this, uh, I, I wanted nothing else to do with these gentlemen. And as far as I'm concerned, I've forgiven them. I've taken that off my heart. As a Christian, I forgive them with all my heart. Does that mean that I'm going to allow myself to be in that position again? Absolutely not. Let me show you what I marked as Exhibit 15, the certified copy of the order you entered, I believe, on May the 3rd, mm -hmm. 2010. Right. You recall that order, Judge? Yes. Okay. Um, and you, uh, was that order... Uh, filed in the Harlan Circuit Court's office? I mean, I got a certified copy from the clerk, so... Well, I would assume if, if uh, Barb certified it, yes. All right. And in this particular order, you're directing the sheriff to resolve, preserve any and all evidence, including, but not limited to, videotapes, audio tapes, and controlled substances in their possession relating to an ongoing investigation presented to the Harlan County Grand Jury involving the Judge Executive's Office of Harlan County. Correct? Yes. And uh, you indicate that the evidence needs to be preserved in order to be presented to the special grand jury 
convening the last week of May 2010. That's what the last line of that order says, yes. correct? Yes. All right. Um, now, when you entered this order, you knew that there had been a no true bill returned, correct? No, I don't think so. The new, no, this was entered on May the 3rd, mm -hmm. and the no true bill, the way I recall the no true bill, it wasn't returned until like 5 or 6 o'clock in the afternoon, and they actually went to Paul Williams, the circuit clerk, and had him wait around after hours to sign the no true bill. And I think this order was entered during the middle of the day uh, from my standpoint to protect myself because my biggest concern was I knew this was a setup from day one to dump in my lap, and I wanted the evidence to be pre to be uh, uh, preserved. So when I come to a hearing like this, if uh, – the tape that they showed me uh, needed to be watched or viewed here, they could watch it. And maybe they still got that, and maybe we can watch that tape and see if it's the same tape they showed me. If that's the reason this order was done, was to preserve the evidence to show them that what they had told me uh, wasn't what they were telling uh, the media and what they were telling everybody else, but except for the ones they told that they had the judge executive locked and will send him to penitentiary. You knew in your heart there was going to be a no true bill, didn't you? I had no idea what the grand jury would do. And that's what, well then, when you entered this order, there's, there's a no true bill returned. Then as far as the Harlem Circuit Court clerk is concerned, there's this general order that's entered mm -hmm. in which you're directing them to prefer, the sheriff to continue to preserve all these evidence, preserve all this evidence so that it could be presented to the special grand jury convening the last week of May, correct? Yes. I, right. you, yes, I did that order to preserve the evidence to protect myself. And did you also consider that... <coughs> because we're heading up to the election, that this would cast a further taint, your order would cast a further taint on the election between Judge Grisham and your cousin. Absolutely not. I'm not aware of that order being disseminated to anybody. It's a matter of public record in the clerk's office, is it not? I have no idea. I mean, if Paul Williams and him disseminate general orders, it's my understanding they don't disseminate general orders. Yeah. It's not It's not sealed. It's not indicated it's a sealed record by the circuit clerk. But I'm not it? aware of anybody being aware of that order outside of me entering it and having <coughs> it served to protect the evidence to show what I did was good faith. That's the reason I did that. And, I mean, the, the, this, this Grisham matter was the subject of intensive media inquiries, correct? There were reports about what was going on. They were following this case pretty closely. Particularly after the Commonwealth attorney called a newspaper reporter into his office, gave her a copy of the order, and told her to lie to the judge executive about where the order came from. Yes, there was a plenty of media attention. So this order then, in all likelihood, if they were following the case, you would have anticipated that the media would be checking the file and they'd see this order where you're indicating the special grand jury is still going to convene and hear testimony and evidence about Judge Grisham. I have no idea what the media is going to do. I never saw that in any media report that I'm aware of. Are you aware of any media report that referenced that order, Mr. Mando? Uh, I'm not, but I don't <laughs> I read all the newspaper accounts and, I understand and the Herald Leader, the Harlan Daily Paper, anywhere else. I'm just asking you yes, sir. what you know. And, um, but to answer your question, I did that order to protect, to protect myself, to let people be able to see uh, what was shown to me. Mr. Chairman, I can keep going. Uh, That's right. Are, I'm at a breaking point, finished? but I can keep going. Whenever the commission and Judge Allred will I'm good to go. Just this. give me a glass of water and I'll go. Are, are you finished with this? Yes. These that, counts? That, that's your well, move this, on. It's a good breaking point where I'm finished with questioning at this point, I believe, about the British economy. You know, for, can that's I? your pleasure. Break for lunch. All right. Uh, it's, I've got 12.25, we'll reconvene a little after 12.25, 12.26, we'll reconvene at 1.30. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.